Britain's royal palaces. Symbols of power. Royal palaces are the bricks and mortar embodiment of what it means to be royal. And prestige. To see it is to believe it. It's a veritable feast for the eyes. Packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. In this series, we step beyond the Golden Gates. We all see inside the palace walls. You feel as if you were being let into a secret world. Learn how these stunning buildings were constructed. This is a mad, eclectic vision of one man. Windsor was built to do battle. It's best not to get locked in one. You don't know when somebody's going to come and let you out. Unveil their spectacular artworks. The Royal Collection is simply stunning. The story of a tiara is like a spy mystery. We can only imagine how excited the Queen must have been. Delve into their gruesome histories. Frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace. And revisit recent events that have shaped the modern royal family. I could see that his legs were trapped. Camilla was one of the most unpopular women in the country. To see those images of the castle in flames, there was an emotional impact for the nation. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, a witness to Prince Philip's Sandringham crash tells us what really happened. The driver couldn't move at all. It was quite obvious then that it was Prince Philip. We uncover the secret history of the Queen's tiara and its role in the Russian Revolution. The story is straight out of a spy novel. We discover the hidden security protecting the future king. If you ever go to Highgrove, you won't see the security. It's invisible. We reveal how a palace became a prison for a future queen. Wonderful, marvellous Kensington Palace was to Victoria a miserable place. We peek behind the scenes at the exotic seaside pleasure dome plundered to decorate Buckingham Palace. This is a mad, eclectic vision of one man and his fantasy of the East. And discover why the king hid in a cupboard and then lied about it. They would want to think of their king as this nervous man in a tiny box room. The British royal palaces are the star attraction for millions of visitors to the UK each year. Now, we all want to see inside the palace walls. It's somewhere that very, very few of us are going to get in our lifetime. Some royal palaces are frequently open to the public, but others are rarely accessible, like the Royal Sandringham Estate. The Queen and Prince Philip spend the winter months at Sandringham and enjoy the freedom the vast estate provides, often driving themselves around. It's very normal to see the Queen and Prince Philip driving around and uh, no one bothers them, and that's why they love it. However, in January 2019, all that changed when 97-year-old Prince Philip was involved in an accident. It was a collision of some force. Prince Philip crashing his car on the Sandringham estate was one of the most shocking stories I think I've ever covered. It was a sunny day in January, so the sun was very low. He was turning onto a main carriageway and he hit a Kia which was carrying two women and a baby. The prince's vehicle flipped onto its side and came to a stop on the shoulder of the road, while the car ended up a few feet away, nosed into a ditch. It was clearly a high-speed crash as he pulled out into the traffic. One eyewitness was on hand to help the prince. I could see that it was an elderly man. I shouted, move your leg, and I heard the reply, where to? The driver couldn't move at all. So I gave it a tug and it freed the leg. Put my forearms under his arms and helped him out backwards. It was quite obvious then that it was Prince Philip. Norfolk police responded to the scene immediately to find a badly shaken prince. This crash was treated like any other crash would be treated. Um, he may be the Duke of Edinburgh, but Prince Philip was breathalyzed, as anyone else involved in the crash would be, and he was then allowed to return to Sandringham. Soon after the crash, attention quickly turned to why the 97-year-old was behind the wheel in the first place. I think it really 
brought home how old the Duke of Edinburgh is and really, should he still be driving? His cause was not helped by the fact he was spotted driving without a seatbelt two days later. To everyone, it seemed that both the palace and um, Prince Philip hadn't taken the crash particularly seriously. Buckingham Palace, in their statement, totally downplayed the seriousness of the crash. Following a public backlash, Prince Philip agreed to give up driving on public roads. He can still drive on the Queen's estates, such as Sandringham and Balmoral. I think for anyone, having to hand in your licence is a big deal. This is a man who was a commander of Royal Navy ships, He's a pilot, he's been driving all of his life, and to, to hand in his licence is like the last vestige of, of normality. Driving on public roads. Don't feel too sorry for them, because they've got plenty of private roads on their various estates that they can drive on. These vast estates mean the royal couple can still surprise high-profile palace visitors by becoming their personal chauffeurs. During the Obama's 2016 visit to Windsor, the president even commented on Prince Philip's driving. So this room is full of mirrors. Where do you, where do you, oh, where would you like Prince Philip famously took President Obama for a drive when the Obamas were here in the UK on a state visit. And Barack Obama released a statement saying that he had never been driven by a Duke of Edinburgh before. This was a first for him and he could report that it was a very smooth ride. But up at the Balmoral estate, the Queen got a less than favourable review when she chauffeured a foreign king. The King of Saudi Arabia was in the UK for a visit back in 1998. Now, at that time, women in Saudi Arabia weren't allowed to drive. So not only did the King have to sort of get his head around this rather bizarre concept, um, the Queen is also quite speedy when she gets behind the wheel. And um, at one point, I think he had to ask her to just slow down a little bit. The royal family has owned Sandringham for over 150 years. Windsor Castle easily trumps that and has been housing royalty for more than nine centuries. But not all royal palaces have such historic lineage. The newest palace in the royal portfolio was actually bought and chosen by the future king, Prince Charles, his country house, Highgrove. For Prince Charles, Highgrove is really just home. It's where you kick your shoes off, put your slippers on, uh, get yourself a, a cup of tea or coffee or a beer and uh, enjoy yourself. It is certainly his number one home. It has a nice sort of lived-in feel. It's the place where Charles really likes to go to more than anywhere. But one thing sets Highgrove apart from other royal residences. He bought it. When Prince Charles bought Highgrove in the 1980s, I think it was prize to everybody. The royal family do not purchase homes, they inherit them. When Highgrove, near Tetbury, came on the market, Charles snapped it up for £865,000. For Charles, it ticked all the boxes as far as architecture, perfect location, and not enormous, nine bedrooms, kind of manageable. Previous heirs to the throne had opted for the grandest properties on offer, like Carlton House in London and the Sandringham Estate looks back at some of his predecessors, certainly Highgrove would not be seen to be suitable at all. For a royal mansion, Highgrove is actually quite small. Buckingham Palace has 775 rooms, and Windsor Castle has a Charles saw there was potential, and he could make it his own. The house isn't architecturally that precious. You can carve whatever kind of house you want out of it, and that's what Charles was looking for. Not a set piece, not to show off, but to make a home from. Charles renovated the main house, giving it a neoclassical facelift. Charles turned a plain box, five windows wide, by three storeys high, into something which had focus to it by putting a pediment over the middle of the main facade. So it wasn't just a plain, straight parapet. It had a triangular point over the centre. It's a lesson learned as far back as ancient Rome. And the point of that was to give you a strong architectural form on top of the centre part of a house to guide you to the door. Of course, what Charles has done is emphasise the entrance to his house that he doesn't want you to look in. Then, with double the budget he spent on the house, Charles turned his attention to his real passion, the gardens. The gardens are absolutely magnificent. He opens them up to the public a few times a year, and it's one of the hottest tickets of the summer months. 
the garden is a masterpiece. Charles has, has consulted all the leading garden designers of his day to produce something which is both contemporary and old fashioned and is very much an organic garden with incredible features. 12 full-time gardeners tend some 15 acres, featuring a multiplicity of different gardens. What Charles found at Highgrove was an overgrown and untended garden. But from that, he started to carve an organized, ordered landscape. An overgrown kitchen garden and 15 acres of mature trees were turned into this wonderful array of intricate rooms and spaces and fun shapes and the you know, real energized design. Charles's new gardens created the perfect playground for young princes William and Harry. They included the sundial garden, a kitchen garden, and a four acre wildflower meadow, which is still flourishing today. Gardening to him, and I think the natural world and eating off the land as organically as possible has been part of his life um, ever since he moved there. And the secret behind his incredible green creations? Well, it might just be his majesty's royal compost. The prince was particularly pleased to show me his sewage garden. So the prince had heard about reed beds, which deal with the sewerage in a, an organic way. And so that's what he has now. These large but very beautiful reed beds where the bodily waste, uh, which he uses. I, I think it's great. I mean, who knows? Is, is the royal sewage, um, you know, sort of some of the best fertilizer in the world? Coming up how and why Prince Charles turned his country palace into Fort Knox. People like Prince Charles were very much top of the IRA's hit list. And how Sandringham was secretly transformed into a radio station for a king's speech. This whole broadcast is a white knuckle ride for the BBC's engineers. When Prince Charles bought Highgrove in 1980, it was far from secure. When he purchased it, this house was surprisingly quite close to uh, a main road. It was quite open, so it was quite easy, obviously, from the main road to kind of see the, the property. Anybody could, at that particular time, you know, scale the fence or the brick wall. And Charles had good reason to fear for his safety. In the early 80s, there wasn't the security risks we have now. Instead, we had the IRA and Northern Irish terrorists and separatists. And of course, they had earlier already killed um, his great uncle, Louis Mountbatten. People like Prince Charles were very much top of the IRA's hit list. For a future king, for the heir to the throne, now to be living out in the countryside in a relatively open area, obviously these measures needed to be brought in to protect him. Charles's team set about rerouting nearby public footpaths and putting in place an aerial exclusion zone. They also installed secret security perimeters that would take a trained eye to spot. If you ever go to Highgrove to look at the garden, you won't see the security. It's invisible. There's no big fences, there's no barbed wire, there's no patrolling dogs. What you are not aware of is that there are cameras, there are ground sensor alarms, there are police officers in the permanent police station on the grounds who are getting all kinds of data fed into them from the exterior. So... Should the perimeters fail, the Georgian house has a secret backup plan, a very modern facility, a panic room. All royal residences have panic rooms, a place where the royals can go in case of emergency. There is one at Highgrove. It's still walled, and once the royals are locked inside, you can't at them at all. It tends to be a room that is safe, that you can lock yourself in with a phone and maybe some water and a sandwich until, you know, the cavalry arrive to retrieve you, drop a rope down through a hole in the middle and escape in a helicopter. It's best not to get locked in one. You don't know when somebody's going to come and let you out. Highgrove's panic room has never been used for its intended purpose, but it was the site of an embarrassing incident involving former Tory MP Rory Stewart. And Rory Stewart had tutored William and Harry, and he became a great friend of Prince Charles, and he was staying at Highgrove one weekend, and inadvertently, 
he went into the bathroom. But this was no ordinary bathroom. It was the panic room. And he couldn't get out. Well, it was, it was armour-plated, the room. So he had to call and shout. And then eventually Prince Charles came in his dressing gown. And they eventually got Rory Stewart out. And with much laughter, I have to say, Prince Charles took it very well and he thought it was very funny. Hidden security keeps Highgrove and the other palaces safe and secure for the royal family. But at Hampton Court in the 15th century, nothing could protect the king from himself. Henry VIII was famously celebrated for his skill at hunting and jousting in royal palaces like Hampton Court, but this passion would prove to be the king's secret downfall. In his early years, Henry VIII was renowned as good-looking, young man, such an athlete. By the end of his life, he got pretty fat, 28 stone, had to be carried around his palaces because he couldn't walk. And he had these dreadful sores that smelt so bad you could smell them from rooms away. In 1536, at Greenwich Palace, Henry has a terrible jousting accident. A horse, covered in all its armour, fell on him. He injured his legs, and this began these really painful ulcers that he had throughout the rest of his life. He really couldn't get anywhere. He actually had a special king's tram, like a sedan chair, that he was carried around Windsor Castle. By 1547, he is too ill. These wounds gave him sepsis. They lanced these awful ulcers with these massive red-hot pokers. His pain made him black in the face. In the 28th of January, 1547, those dreadful ulcers that had made the great king so sick, so impained, and for many, so repellent, they finally brought an end to his life at Whitehall Palace. What happens behind the palace walls is often shrouded in mystery for years after the monarch involved has died. But in 1932, Sandringham witnessed a major event that would forever alter the way the royals communicate with us their loyal subjects. King George V was monarch during a deep economic depression for the UK and the world. The country was in dire straits. There'd been the big financial crash in the late 20s. The political situation in Europe was not as good as it should be. The dominions were given more independence from Parliament at Westminster. And so the empire was just starting to turn into something looser, the Commonwealth. It was an era of rapid change. The faltering British Commonwealth desperately needed reassurance from their king that everything would be OK. George V had to be that figure to unite the people. He needed to consolidate his position in the new empire and the new Commonwealth. It is a deep pleasure to us. But the king was nervous. While his son, George VI, would famously dread public speaking, thanks to a lifelong stammer, it was the groundbreaking new radio technology and its long reach that was putting this confident king off his game. His audience was vast. It was probably the largest audience anyone in the world had ever had up to that point. Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald finally persuaded the king to give his inspiring address to the UK and the Commonwealth. The date was chosen, the 25th of December. Christmas Day was the most important day of the year for the BBC. The day centred on an extraordinary series of outside broadcasts from all across the empire and all across Britain. This hour-long technological extravaganza was to culminate in the King's address. The King always spent Christmas Day at Sandringham, so this royal home had to be transformed into a temporary radio station. This whole broadcast is a white knuckle ride for the BBC's engineers. You've got telephone lines to book, you've got transmitters that need to be working. Microphones were enormous. These big metal contraptions, sometimes on wheels with lots of cables. It's an amazing engineering. By the King, from the least likely location in the palace. Cupboard is moments away from an address to his people in the first ever Royal Live Radio broadcast. 
His objective was to unify an empire that was developing into something the likes of which the world had never seen, the Commonwealth. Inside Sandringham, the king had 775 rooms to choose from. The official photograph suggests it took place in one of the many grand rooms. The photograph we have shows him in what looks like a drawing room. It's heavily decorated in that Edwardian style that Sandringham is known for. But this was staged for the camera. The king actually decided to make this important speech from one of the smallest rooms in the palace, a box room under the stairs, a fact they had to keep secret. It's about that projection that you give to the public. They wouldn't want to think of their king as this nervous man in a tiny box room at his country vault hall. They want to think of him as a stately man, a confident one. The king was due to make this historic address at 3 p.m., chosen to reach the widest audience around the world. The speech was written for him by Rudyard Kipling. Someone in the control room of Broadcasting House in London would have flicked a switch and a little light would have appeared and he would have started his speech. The king began by greeting his loyal subjects all across the empire on Christmas Day through the wonders of new radio technology. We can see this intimacy in the language George used. He speaks in the first person. He told them he was recording from his home at Sandringham. One of the things he says is, I speak now from my home and from my heart to you all, drawing attention to the fact that this is live and that this is personal. And the king signed off with the warmest seasonal greetings to all of his subjects, surrounded by their families at Christmas. And right across the empire, he blessed them all. The Christmas address, broadcast from inside a tiny royal box room, was a success, with a global audience of 20 million people tuning in. People could actually hear the king speaking in their own homes through the wireless set. This was revolutionary, and it did definitely bring the king much closer to them. It's an absolutely brilliant speech. It's well written, it's well delivered. As far as speeches go, you couldn't ask for anything more. And I don't think he'd ever delivered a speech as important in his life, and I don't think any of his ancestors had. He made history. Sometimes, the palaces are used as the staging point for much more damaging deceits and downright lie was Henry VIII's great deception. After breaking away from the church in Rome, Henry started plundering the monasteries, leaving the Catholic faithful in uproar. That's really very upsetting to many people in the country who feel that Catholicism is the true religion. So there began to be an uprising led by Robert Ask, a northern landowner. They take Pontefract Castle. They've got 35,000 men. It becomes known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. Henry flees to Windsor and there he makes a plan. Henry invited Robert Ask to this marvellous Christmas at Windsor Castle. They pour out the stops. Henry and Robert had a great time. They pulled the equivalent of a Tudor cracker. Henry gave them the equivalent of a Tudor turkey. And even Henry said to Robert, you can have a gift, a crimson satin jacket. And Henry promised Robert Ask pardons. He said he would consider all the demands. So Robert Ask is convinced that the king means well, goes back to the north and says, OK, chaps, let's call off the rebellion. No, Henry was only playing at being Mr. Nice Guy. And his plan all along was to get them back. The minute they call off the rebellion and disperse, Henry sends out his men to hunt down the rebels. They are put on trial and most of them are executed and Robert Ask himself is hanged and his body is put in chains gibbeted in York Castle. It is the biggest signal to the whole country that don't rebel against me. Thus, Windsor Castle becomes the site of the biggest royal double cross in Tudor history, if not history itself. Regardless of the odd stench of betrayal, the royal palaces are a tantalising pit stop for visitors, eager to pull back the curtain and peek through the royal keyhole. And it's not just the buildings themselves that are the object of such endless fascination. It's also the priceless artefacts accumulated by kings and queens through the centuries. 
The royal collection is just stunning. It's extraordinary to walk around the palaces and wherever you look, you are surrounded by the old masters and every sculpture, every vase is precious and priceless. Palace art and artifacts come from all over the world. The Royal Collection is bursting at the seams with art from China and Japan. It holds some of the most historically important examples of Eastern art that exist in the Western world. There are more than 2,000 works of Asian art in the Royal Collection. While many monarchs have added to the extensive collection, most of the Chinese and Eastern inspired art was collected by George IV. He but he was also hugely satirised by the public and the popular press. He was large, he was gouty, he ate too much, he drank too much. Although he was controversial, the things he'd left behind are very impressive. George IV was a huge patron of the arts and one of the greatest benefactors of the Royal Collection. He was interested in what was going on elsewhere in the world, and he tried to draw all of that into Britain to make it a more cosmopolitan place. And his tastes are obviously approved of by today's royal family. Tucked away in one of the Queen's private rooms at Buckingham Palace are two pieces bought by George IV. This beautiful pair of porcelain pheasants were made, made in 1815. They'd been made in a place called Jingdezhan in China, which was the centre, the greatest production centre of ceramics since the 14th century. They're startlingly contemporary in a way. Their positioning with this upright thrust of the beaks, the way that the core grips onto the stalk beneath, it's got a real dynamism to it, but it's also very stylized. And then just having that variegation of colour, the sort of shimmer of the different feathers alongside each other, I think they're really beautiful. Now they peer over the Queen's shoulder at her visitors, as if they have always belonged there. But this wasn't the first royal palace that these birds were displayed in. They originally came from a different place, a forgotten palace kitted out by George IV. Before the pheasants moved to Buckingham Palace around 1847, we know that they originally lived in Brighton Pavilion because there's an etching made around 1820 that shows them on the mantelpiece. This was the long gallery in a palace unlike any other, Brighton's Royal Pavilion. The Brighton Pavilion was George IV's pet project, his passion project. Created when he was Prince of Wales, Brighton Pavilion would be the perfect party palace. You've got Chinese and Indian motifs, you've got Regency grandeur, you've got French influence and Gothic influence. It's this total mishmash of styles. Brighton Pavilion can be considered as a piece of art in itself, a piece of art which Queen Victoria hated. Victoria inherited Brighton Pavilion when she took the throne, but she never there really wasn't room for her ever expanding family. Victoria ended up selling off Brighton Pavilion for just £53,000. Pearls hang from the loops, each of which is worth thousands of pounds. Behind its shimmering exterior lies an untold story of glamour, intrigue and daring adventure. The story of how the tiara got into the hands of the British royals is something a bit like a spy mystery. The story began in Russia in 1874. It was made by the imperial jewellers to the Russian royal family for Maria Pavlovna, the wife of Grand Duke Vladimir, the Tsar's brother. But after the revolution of 1917, communist Russia was no longer safe for aristocrats as wealthy and prominent as Maria Pavlovna. When the Russian royal family came tumbling down, she hid her precious jewels in a secret compartment within her home, escaping with just her day jewels. The Grand Duchess would ask Romanov to escape Russia, 
dying in France in 1920. Her family had lost everything, except for the jewels. Hidden in a secret alcove in her palace, the tiara was under the noses of the Bolshevik government for many years. Her son, Grand Duke Boris, persuades an art dealer friend of his to smuggle themselves into the country and get the jewels out. And then miraculously transports them 1,300 miles back across Europe, hidden in a leather Gladstone bag, all the way back to London. Queen Mary bought the tiara for £28,000. Now, that's about the equivalent of one and a quarter million pounds today, a huge amount. It can also be worn with a stunning set of green emeralds and drops that came from her own family's cache of gems. These family emeralds, known as the Cambridge Emeralds, were amazingly won in a charity raffle in Germany by Queen Mary's mother, Augusta, a German princess and the first Duchess of Cambridge. In 1953, the newly crowned Queen Elizabeth inherited the tiara directly from her grandmother, and it has been a royal favourite during her reign. The Queen wears it all those different ways, and each time it feels like a fresh new piece. There is a Vladimir tiara to suit every occasion. She opted for green with the Cambridge Emeralds when she hosted the Irish Tea Shop at Buckingham Palace in 2014. With a value in excess of £10 million, it's secured in a secret vault the size of an ice rink, 40 feet below Buckingham Palace. Queen Victoria moved into Buckingham Palace in 1837, leaving behind her childhood home, Kensington Palace. She hated the West London Palace, thanks mainly to the mysterious and secret Kensington system. So Victoria's father died when she was very young and Victoria's mother, a German widow, becomes very reliant on this chap called John Conroy, who really is the baddie of the piece. I don't think anyone can really find many redeeming features in John Conroy. Victoria's mother, Victoire, and her mother's advisor, John Conroy, club together to make Victoria their creature. What they hoped was that Victoria would come to the throne as a child and then they could continue to dominate her and get huge amounts of power. So what was the Kensington system? Well, it was pretty bad. Victoria was watched by Conroy or by her mother all day long. And then when she went to bed in her mother's room, someone stood over her to watch her in bed until her mother came to bed. And she wasn't allowed to do anything. She couldn't even walk downstairs by herself. And she certainly wasn't allowed to have real playmates. Victoria hated both of them. She hated the Kensington system. And although she smiled in public, she really didn't like it. Victoria felt very ill. She's suffering. And Victoria's mother, she's standing over her saying, you must make Conroy in charge of all your money when you come to the throne. Sign this, promise. And Victoria, with an unbelievable amount of strength for a teenage girl who is very ill, she doesn't sign. But after that, she is really furious with her mother. And the Kensington system becomes really a battle of will side and Victoria on the other. Finally, Victoria turns 18 and not many weeks after the king dies and Victoria becomes queen she's told at kensington palace the place of the kensington system that she is queen early in the morning and victoria aged 18 she's now the most powerful woman in the world and what does she want well, what she asks for is an hour alone because she's never ever had an hour alone just to think without her mother watching her victoria moves to buckingham palace and that is the essential word to her mother mother you have played the game and you've lost this wonderful, marvellous Kensington Palace was to Victoria a miserable place, and it was unsurprising that she really never went back there. Next time, we uncover the secrets of the ever-expanding family housing complex at Kensington Palace. They turned it into an architectural monster. We meet the master craftsman who took on the tricky Windsor Castle restoration. My blood pressure went up and I went grey.
process. And we reveal some of the oddest gifts the Queen has ever received. She was given a crocodile and her private secretary had to put it in his bath on Britannia. It was clearly a high-speed crash as he pulled out into the traffic. One eyewitness was on hand to help the prince. I could see that it was an elderly man. I shouted, move your leg, and I heard the reply, where to? The driver couldn't move at all. So I gave it a tug, and it freed the leg. Put my forearms under his arms, and helped him out backwards. It was quite obvious then that it was Prince Philip. Norfolk police responded to the scene immediately to find a badly shaken prince. This crash was treated like any other crash would be treated. Um, he may be the Duke of Edinburgh, but Prince Philip was breathalyzed, as anyone else involved in the crash would be, and he was then allowed to return to Sandringham. Soon after the crash, attention quickly turned to why the 97-year-old was behind the wheel in the first place. I think it really brought home how old the Duke of Edinburgh is, and really, should he still be driving? His cause was not helped by the fact he was spotted driving without a seatbelt two days later. To everyone, it seemed that both the palace and um, Prince Philip hadn't taken the crash particularly seriously. Buckingham Palace, in their statement, totally downplayed the seriousness of the crash. Following a public backlash, Prince Philip agreed to give up driving on public roads. He can still drive on the Queen's estates, such as Sandringham and Balmoral. I think for anyone, having to hand in your licence is a big deal. This is a man who was a commander of Royal Navy ships. He's a pilot. He's been driving all of his life. And to, to hand in his licence is like the last vestige of, of normality. Driving on public roads. Don't feel too sorry for them because they've got plenty of private roads on their various estates that they can drive on. These vast estates mean the royal couple can still surprise high-profile palace visitors by becoming 